Did the article to whom it may concern come as a complete surprise to you, or were you expecting something along those lines? It came as an enormous surprise to me. It came as a shattering disillusionment to me. It came, in a way, as one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. You see, prior to the publication of that attack on me and on Barbara Brandon, I was primarily focused upon my role in that whole drama and I was concerned to understand what mistakes I had made and why they had happened and I wasn't thinking yet that hard about Miss Rand or Miss Rand's side of the story. I had seen plenty of evidence of a great many irrational attitudes on her part toward me, toward Barbara Brandon and toward the other figures involved in this drama not named in Miss Rand's denunciation, because to name them would have been very awkward for Miss Rand. But I really didn't appreciate the psychological state she was in until I read her denunciation. And in a different sense, I didn't fully appreciate it until several months thereafter. Because you have to realize that this woman, in spite of our conflicts growing over the past several years, had been my idol since I was 14 years old, as I've already said. And to see that kind of filthy, evasive smear, those kind of wild, unsubstantiated charges, those checks on Barbara Brandon, who was really a heroic figure in the whole drama, because she took my side when I had hurt her, when every kind of pressure imaginable was on her to remain on Ayn Rand's side. And therefore her suggestion of Barbara Brandon's motives as being in some sense financial, when Barbara Brandon at that point virtually threw away everything financially because she knew that the things Miss Rand was alleging about me were viciously untrue, Barbara Brandon really was a very courageous woman in that whole story, and therefore the snide allegations made against her by Miss Rand were and are truly disgusting, and that shocked me and shocked a great many other people, as I'm sure you appreciate. It took me many months thereafter to digest and to come to grips with, with how many years of evidence there was to prepare me for the spirit of that denunciation if my eyes had been opened to see it. But yes, I most certainly was shocked. I knew there was going to be some kind of announcement that Miss Rand and I had parted company, some sort of repudiation by Miss Rand, some sort of announcement that I was no longer with the objectivist. I never imagined that kind of outrageous attack and at the time I knew that the real person who she has destroyed as far as reputation goes is not me but her because I knew that any independent intelligent person is going to know that this is not an article written by a rational responsible person with legitimate grievances not written that way. And what amazed me is how many people, just from her letter and ahead of reading my answer, guessed certain key features of the truth and what was really inflaming her. What type of mail did you receive after your split with Ayn Rand? A great deal of letters. People who wrote expressing concern, respect, who told me of their own reactions to Miss Rand's article, who complimented Barbara Brandon and me on the style of our answer, contrasting our way of discussing the issue with Miss Rand's. 
I even had two offers of people who wanted to finance a new Nathaniel Brandon Institute on the West Coast, which I declined. A few letters of attack, very few. I mean, maybe five or six as near as I can remember. Many hundreds of letters that touched Barbara Brandon and myself enormously. And one of the interesting features of those letters was, and this rather amused me, the number of times with reference to the concluding paragraph of my article, their letter writer would say, I told my husband that was involved and he said I was crazy. Or I told my wife that was involved and she laughed at me. People are not stupid. You see, that article of Miss Rand's really between the lines and on the lines conveys, if you think about it, an enormous intellectual contempt for her readers. Not only because in the concluding paragraph she virtually requests them, they take her unsupported statements entirely on faith, but because the whole article is so vague that many people reading it wanted to know, well, what exactly is it that Brandon has done? You can't even find that out after reading this long harangue. People are not stupid. And they know what they are reading. At least many of them do when they read that kind of presentation. And I was counting on the fact that they would. If the split had not occurred, do you think you'd still be at NBI? I hope not. I have no way of being able to answer that question. I hope that I would have had the brains to realize that my life, my happiness, and my intellectual future required breaking out of that atmosphere and environment. It's very difficult for me to know what would have happened. I believe that the split was inevitable. And this leads me to another interesting point. One of the things that amazed me after the break came was the number of people who expressed to me the thought that they were not at all surprised, but had felt that it was inevitable that the break would come. Not because of the particular events which did precipitate the break, but on general principle. They realized that I was in a very untenable position in New York, and that for me to be investing that much of my time in teaching objectivism and in spreading objectivism at the expense of my own career, my own professional interests, and to tie up my whole professional life that much with another person was a mistake on any account. The kind of life that my wife Patricia and I have created for ourselves since leaving New York here is so different from the world left behind and so superior intellectually as well as emotionally I cannot imagine what my life would have been if the split had not occurred I can't even visualize it because what I have now is so much what I've always wanted and so much what I've always needed that if the split hadn't occurred over the incidents that it did occur it would have come over something else it had to come that atmosphere was not for me it's not for anybody who wants an independent life. After the split, why did you come to Los Angeles rather than remain in New York and set up a practice there? There were several reasons for that. As you probably know, for a number of years prior to the break, I used to visit California every year, lecture here, sometimes give whole courses over the summer. And I had been becoming progressively fonder of Los Angeles during those preceding years. In fact, several years earlier, I had begun to voice the thought that I might very much enjoy living in Los Angeles. I like the life, I like many aspects of the life, so that my mind was somewhat looking westward anyway. Then there's the fact that Patricia wanted to investigate film and television. She's an actress. She had done stage work in the East, but she wanted to get into films and that her own career required that she come west. Another factor was that on my visits to the west, I found 
a generally much freer intellectual atmosphere than in the East. I mean a greater receptivity to new ideas in the field of psychology. And I've spoken to other people in other fields who have reported similar observations. There's more of a frontier feeling out here. There's more of an open-mindedness. The East is much more closed and intellectually tight.